What's that? Maybe. I hope so. <laughs> you know, it's funny you're drunk. Oh, living the dream. You had a busy night tonight. Two reports. <laughs> I'm not really good at farming ash. I gotta do it for like the environmental oh, okay. like the natural resources and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, environment. Mm -hmm. mm. Maybe I can just shoot down anybody that have a bomb for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. You have two reports? Yeah, two reports. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> hey, Doc. Are you okay to, uh, to be in there? <laughs> okay, good, thank you.
call the school board meeting to order. Will the board secretary take the roll? Mr. Jim Bard. Present. Mr. Dwayne Burt. Here. Mr. Levi Kressler. Here. Mrs. Stephanie Eberly. Here. Dr. Nathan Goats. Here. Mr. Don Hilbinger. Here. Mr. Fred Scott. Here. Mr. Charlie Suters. Here. Mr. Mark Butterball. Present. Miss Allison Hunt. Mr. Caden Yonish. Here. Everybody please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. begin our deliberations this evening, let us once again be reminded of our duty to represent all of the children in the school district, regardless of age, sex, race, or creed, regardless of need or ability. May we now have a moment of silence to reflect on our thoughts, plans, actions on behalf of the students of the Shippensburg School District, and a moment of silence for Heather Swartz, who passed away February 11th. She was a 1987 graduate of the high school. Margaret Kaufman, who passed away February 11th. She was a former part-time English language tutor for the district. Elaine Keener, who passed away February 15th. She's a 1951 graduate of the high school. Lincoln Vogelsanger, February 22nd. He was a 1946 graduate of the high school and former instrumental music teacher in the district. And Robert McCurdy Sr., who passed away February 22nd. He's a father of Bob McCurdy, who's a first grade teacher at James Byrd. Thank you. I wanna remind everybody that uh, the meeting is being live streamed. Dr. Suppo, are there any changes or deletions or additions to the agenda? We have a couple of changes to the agenda. Under the curriculum port, report, Mrs. Woodall is absent this evening. Under item 4G, consent agenda, this is regarding the Summer Academy. It should read, Summer Academy teachers will be paid utilizing ESSER funds at a rate of $60 per hour. I would like to add, secondary teachers will receive a stipend of $2,400. Elementary teachers will receive a stipend of $1,800. For board members' uh, information, this is the same as we did last year and is uh, e equals the $60 per hour. Also on the discussion agenda, item 6E, while not voting on this this evening, um, the second grade was looking at an option to go to the Senator's baseball game. We'll be, we will be removing that from 6E as they are looking at going to the uh, Colonel Denning State Park. Those are all the changes. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Move to approve. Moved by Mr. Suter, second. Fred Scott, second. Second by Mr. Scott, roll call. Mr. Jim Bard. Yeah. Mr. Dwayne Burt. Yes. Mr. Levi Kressler. Yes. Mrs. Stephanie Eberly. Yes. Dr. Nathan Goats. Yes. Mr. Don Hilbinger. Yes. Mr. Fred Scott. Yes. Mr. Charlie Suters. Yes. Mr. Mark Butterball. Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Christy. Um, we'll now move on to citizen comments. Uh, for the public and for those who are watching streaming who may have tuned in for the first time, we have two public comment periods. The first public comment in the beginning of the meeting is for anybody who um, has signed up and wants to address uh, an agenda item. The second section is at the end of the meeting and that is for if an individual has a public comment on any other topic that they wish to address the board. So now move on to public comment. I'm sorry if I didn't take these in order. They're not in order anymore. But. Bruce Hawkersmith. Bruce Hawker Smith, 703 Martin Avenue, Chippensburg, Pennsylvania. I wish to speak on item 6A. 
Stadium. Uh, I believe that you all have received uh, from me a letter uh, concerning my position. I am here this evening again to offer the help of the Shippensburg Borough Council. And I want, to, I want you to understand that we as a council understand that the park has not, over the past year, been maintained as it should have been. And I learned today that our students need better. I believe that truly, that our students need better and everything that the Borough of Shippensburg can do to help this happen, we will do within our power. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure I'm not missing anybody here. Barbara Dickey, and Barbara, you requested five minutes. That's granted. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Barbara Dickey. I live in the district. Greetings to you all again. I want to address the following issues in a call to action. The canceled band trip and the lack of integrity between the board and the administration about decisions which impact community support, which you currently do not have. The speed in which other school districts get communication from the administration on items other than weather. Three, a lack of efficiency at these facility meetings and the discussions during these board meetings about property. All of these topics can be woven into one nice, neat plan, accountability and integrity. If you do not live in this community, you're not invested. If the community is not advised in a timely manner or involved in all decision making, what you do is you become, what you be do becomes immaterial and not student or, or community driven. You, the school board, took an oath of office promising us the stakeholders that you would serve us the best of your abilities. That has not always happened. You've allowed decisions to be made behind your back, such as masking, the canceled band trip, and etc. One more example of injustices done to our students. Obviously, these three topics will be on my agenda until they get satisfaction. I want to tackle the canceled band trip. It was canceled without the entire board's awareness, as well as key people who would have brought crucial solutions to the table. My question, and I want an answer now, why was the Chambersburg School District not contacted as to what they did to handle the things that the group that made the decision to cancel thought they could not work out? Chambersburg went to Florida and is there now. Why, why, why? After the school board approved this trip during a much more serious threat of a virus in the fall of 2021, October, I believe, why was it canceled? What are you not telling us? What are you going to do to make amends? This is the number one issue that we, the stakeholders, need an answer. We will not be ignored, bullied, or harassed. Number two issue, school districts across the state sent out communications following CDC guidelines that masking was optional in public places and on land transportation, not Chippensburg. Why, why, why? Who dropped the ball? Who needs to be held accountable? Issue three, inefficient facility meetings and school board meetings that go on and on and on about property, not one mention of student needs or wants. You're looking at an auditorium full, and it would be full if they thought their input mattered, of competent people who have, who have good suggestions to get the job done, as well as you're looking at the chair of the business partnership between Dansville, New York School District and all of the town's businesses. They were invested in each other. You're looking at the liaison between the schools in Buff State, RIT, and Clarence Economic Departments, as well as supervisor of student teachers. Do not tell me that we do not matter. Do not tell me or imply by your silence to my 30 emails that we do not matter. Tonight or within 24 hours, I want answers or resignations need to take place. You're either part of the problem or part of the solution. I've been an educator for 50 years, a social worker for 23. The giants and lions in this community are waking up, and we the people are invested in our children, and we need you to be as well, or your participation here is meaningless and of no value. We need and want answers about the canceled band trip, amends to the student, and greater accountability between this board and the administration. We the community need and want more timely communication beyond whether notification. We the community need and want more input and efficiency about our property, the school district. 
This is a good time to step up or resign. We need to get the job done tonight. Many of us have spent long hours assisting you in this health and safety plan and want to wrap it up so that we all move on. These are the three other points I'd like to address. We are calling you to repeal the current health and safety plan and replace it with simple suggestions. We're calling for accountability for school schedule changes beyond weather. We want to address the COVID coordinator, coordinator position and contract with the University for Grace B. Lures. This is a call to action to repeal the current health and safety plan that positions the schools as if they are health facilities rather than environments of good, solid education. I began teaching in, Sol in Fox Chapel in 1969, and it was hands-on. And we were in the woods, and we were in the fields. We need to return to that. That means face coverings are optional, according to parents' choice anywhere. No more temperature taking, no more contact tracing, no more social distancing, no more quarantining, no more inoculation clinics, all of which belong to the health care facilities and under the jurisdiction of the Department of Health. But with the stipulation that the Department of Health can no longer quarantine the well, which was deemed null and void by our PA Commonwealth Court and the Supreme Court in October and December, respectively. This needs to be gone and not be brought back again. Two, we need to make it very clear that changes to policy and procedure, such as school closings, health and safety, other than inclement weather, belongs Barbara, to the school board. Five minutes is up. Thank you. Thank you. Travis Hoover. Travis Hoover, Middle Spring Road. Why? Why is this administration constantly behind the ball? It has been known since Friday that the CDC changed recommendations for mass transportation. And you tell us all the time how you get updated guidance about it and you pursue everything immediately. That's right. The recommendations were never law, yet here we are. The people of Shippensburg have yet to receive a call or an email informing them that the majority of all the local schools have already had theirs out by at least Sunday morning. Mr. Osuppo, every email I send to you and the board and talk about your administration pushing an agenda, you always reply with, I'd like to know what my agenda is. Well, it's pretty clear. Every time when you choose to not notify any of the parents of changes until days later, we conveniently have to ask at these meetings, it appears your agenda is to stay in power of the medical decisions of our children and keep them in lockdown. You can say it isn't so, but your actions are speaking louder than your words. It appears you're okay with the mental or physical harm that these ridiculous ideas do to our children. You make it clearer every time. It was clear when our band wasn't allowed to go on that's, the That's a personal attack. I will no longer sit here. You can stop right now. I will not listen to that. That is untrue. I've done nothing but... Chris, you don't have you to ask me. Travis, stop. If you have an issue you want to talk to the board about, you can talk about an issue with the board. Okay, hopefully they'll reply to my emails at some point then. Also, why are we starting a fourth generation of students that will never have a normal year? Are your board members aware that the kindergarten registration for next year is being held virtually? This is completely asinine. These restrictions are being removed so fast every day it's comical, yet Shippensburg is going to register kids through a virtual meeting? This is ridiculous. These kids are young and have never been in a school setting. The experience of getting to come to the library, or if you can't have it there, have it at one of the schools, is part of the, part of the relationship. It gets them to meet with the people, meet the teachers, realize what they're getting into. They've never been in a school setting. Tonight is the night. These issues need to change. Let's not have a fourth generation of students that never see a normal year and suffer from emotional and medical, mental physical harm due to the agenda being pushed on people. Repeal the health and safety plan completely and remove the COVID coordinator position. I'm tired of the nonsense game. William Brown. CDC recommendations. Um, doesn't mean I necessarily agree with that, but at least uh, I'm not here to lecture you. So we are opening a new chapter in terms of the COVID response rates. It's pretty clear that CDC has stepped up and said, look, masks are probably not as critical as we thought they were, although there's a lot of people that are still at risk in our society. So one of the things I look at the school board as having its role is not just protect our students, so that our, that our kids, but also to protect the community. You know, your job extends beyond our students. We have a whole community of people that are responsible for how our students operate how they live in our world, and who they interact with as well. If we 
have a rash of flu in our school, it's going to translate to the parents, grandparents not being well. So if we have a rash of COVID in the school, it's going to translate to the parents, grandparents as well. Um, if people are vaccinated, we're obviously a whole lot in better shape. And if you look at the CDC statistics, they say that the unvaccinated adults 18 plus years of age are 14 times likely to die from the virus compared to those fully vaccinated but not boosted. Further, they say that the adults 18 years of age are and more are 41 times as likely to die from the virus compared to those fully vaccinated with the booster intact. So one of the things I think you should be doing as a board is to help kind of convey the message that's out there because I think a lot of people don't get the right message from the government. I know that people like Trust the government, we can't do that, but the government has a role, which is to take care of the well being of, of the people. So, what I, what I have as a concern is look, look, my family's not here. Um, you all have families here, it's great. I appreciate that. I would want to protect my family like crazy. Um, in a week, I'm going to go see my parents who are down in Florida from some mistaken trip. Um, they live in Indiana, to be clear, the state of Indiana. And I have to try to get them back safely. So, they're not young, they're like nine years of age, and our whole concern has been like, you're going to Florida for the damn pandemic, why would you do that? But we still have to, you know, some kind of protect that they're down there to get them back safely. So they're vaccinated, which is great. Uh, the risk is a lot, lot lower. But again, there are a lot of people in our community who are not vaccinated. There's a lot of people who are old in our community who are not vaccinated. And we need to be sure that we're sort of protecting those people too. So I'd like to see the school board do effectively to say, look, we're going to try to communicate with, with the town to our students, if nothing else. Send the messages out from the CDC about what the risk rates happen to be. And we convey the idea that, look, we're not out of this pandemic yet. It sounds great to take off the mask. Like, that's fantastic. I totally want that, too. Um, but I also want to protect the people around me. And they're not my family, to be clear. I'm protecting you and you and you and your parents and your relatives and everybody else by wearing my mask in the grocery store, wherever else I go. I can be sick. That's great. I don't know if I am or not, but I'd like to protect you because that's what I want to do. So it'd be great if we would all feel that way, just to, like, take care of other people. But again, if the school board can find a way to put this in the health and safety plan to say, look, we're going to try to communicate better to the community about what the risk profiles are. That would be really effective. The CDC puts some information about like, every week of updates. So, you know, if you guys can be like, here's a new statistic, let's keep sharing the information with the world because we need it. People need the information. It's not Facebook. It's not QAnon. It's, it's information. Here. So, I think, so, thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Amanda McNair. Tonight, I want to speak on items 6A and 6C. For item 6A, which will be at the athletic stadium, I just want to say I appreciate the steps taken to decide on the location. It does seem that we need a bit of collaboration with the Budget and Finance Committee to understand what can really be afforded and truly make headway. Moving on to 6C, the health and safety plan. I ask that you please revise the health and safety plan to minimal additional burdens, to minimize additional burdens on the staff, students, and family. Go back to policies that are in place to, prior to COVID for all schools, including GPUs and all transportation. As a reminder, Board Policy 246, School Wellness, lays out a strong plan, if in compliance, that would support the health and well-being of our children 24-7, 365 days of the year. There has been little to no focus on the guidelines outlined in the policy over the last two years. COVID did not make the policy null and void. It seems we've abandoned empowering our children and families to maintain and improve our health, which includes the ability to fight illness and disease. In the last meeting, I requested more details on the committee as it is today. Details would be appreciated. There are many guidelines included in this policy. There are many more responsibilities to our children and families in this policy. Back to my mention of transportation above, I, along with many others in the community, would like to understand how the board and or the administration has quickly reacted over the last two years to apply additional restrictions as the CDC and or the Department of Health advised, but with the CDC update on the removal of, of the mandate to wear masks on buses and vans on Friday, February 25th, 2022, we have heard nothing from the leaders in the district advising that we would follow suit and remove this mandate. Other schools in our local area have already sent out communication and I did check my email when I got here at seven o'clock. I haven't seen anything yet. Um, but other schools have communicated this out to their children and families. Shippensburg is a day late and a dollar short on this. Being quick to align with the update could have been a great means of healing some wounds, but no. To be better, we must do better. Please remedy this tonight. As always, I appreciate your time and your service as well as your kindness tonight. Thank you, Amanda. 
Chris Jackson. Emergency period. When does the health and safety plan get repealed and we go back to how things were, more or less, before this pandemic hit? Well, the time to do that is now. If not prior to now, it's tonight. I would encourage you to do the next right thing tonight and repeal the entire health and safety plan. Repeal and go back to how we were uh, prior to this. I have a copy of the plan, if you don't have it, but all of you have it in your email. Uh, of the plan that we are proposing that you adopt or just repeal it tonight and know that next meeting you get an ESSER compliant one put in place. But we've done the hard work. It's here. We're here to help. We care about our kids. I hope all of you do as well. If you don't and if your actions don't show that you care about our kids and putting as little burden on them as you can for this virus, then why are you sitting in the seat you're sitting in? Why are you in the role with the school district? Why are you in the seats in the school board? Why are you in the administration? If you're not working hard to provide and focus on the education of our children, and that's your primary focus, and putting as little burden on them that gets in the way of that as possible, plead of you. We need five. We want six. Gosh, it'd be great if all nine, but I wouldn't count on that for one second. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to student representative report. Caden. Thank you. So, since my last report, the annual winter dance was held Saturday in a new modified carnival form where Cole Pearson was crowned king. Freshmen, sophomores, and juniors completed their scheduling for next year. Aiden Estep, Alex Holderbaum, John Vaines, Kevin Foxworth, Patrick Reed, Drew Fry, Dominic Frontino, John Gleason, Diesel Kozier, and Eddie Alcatera qualified for sectionals last Saturday. Diesel, John Gleason, and Dominic moved on to districts, and there, Diesel placed fourth and Dominic placed second, moving them to states. Bryce Patillo placed fourth, Erica Buckheister, Erica Buckheister placed 11th, and Kylie Ramsey placed 14th in the diving districts. Jed Ritchie set the new school record in the 500 meter freestyle with a time of four minutes and 52 seconds, and placed fifth at mid pens in the process. Congrats, Jed. Boys basketball is competing right now in the district semifinals at West York, and have already punched a ticket to the state playoffs and they also finished as a mid-pen runner-up. The annual senior trip has been planned and will be a day to Pittsburgh with many fest festivities, including a cruise buffet and a trip to the zoo. The annual blood drive scheduled for last Friday was postponed to May 11th. The NHS, NHS held a carnation sale for Valentine's Day. The Shipworks student started a new business in the high school called, Ship, called Shipworks Coffee, where they sell coffee, hot chocolate, tea, mochas, and more. The winter band, sharps, course, and orchestra concerts were all held since my last report. And this year's musical, My Fair Lady, is opening March 10th, and this week is Tech Week for them. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Caden. Appreciate it. Franklin County Career Center report. Mr. Burt. Well, thank you very much. Um, first of all, February 16th, the personnel committee met with uh, of the uh, joint operating committee of the Career Center, met with uh, staff and administration to uh, further flesh out plans for the administrative director's search. Um, and, and just to highlight uh, beyond that, a few dates um, from the plan. March 7th is deadline for applications. Uh, first round of interviews is scheduled for March 22nd through 24th. Second round of interviews is planned for March 30th and 31st with the uh, overall plan to have a new director appointed um, in the uh, April, uh, by, well, by the end of April time frame. Uh, further, the Budget and Finance Committee uh, of uh, the Franklin County Career and Technology Center met on uh, this past Thursday uh, prior to the uh, board meeting. And uh, from, that, from that committee meeting, the uh, Budget and Finance Committee will be proposing to, uh, to the full board at the next month and then um, once the, the board approves the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, budget, uh, that budget will, will come uh, to each of the sending school districts boards will come to us and so forth. But just to give you a few highlights, the uh, Budget and Finance Committee will be proposing uh, essentially a status quo on programming. 
Uh, that includes a full year of the, the new program uh, that was in last year's budget for half year uh, of uh, early childhood, the new early childhood program, and uh, an additional position uh, for outreach services coordinator. The uh, overall uh, planned increase will uh, represent a 2.14% increase. Um, and, and as you know, the, the, uh, the, the budget for the Career and Technology Center is based on a uh, uh, three-year look back on uh, ADMs, which stands for Average Daily Membership. Uh, perhaps we have a slide here. I thought you might like just to see uh, what the three-year look back looks like. Um, for Shippensburg, you can see uh, we represent, uh, we will represent in next year's budget based on the three-year look back of ADMs, 16.3% uh, uh, of, uh, of the school, and we'll bear 16.3% of, uh, uh, of the operating costs. And, and I think it's, um, it, it's certainly um, worth noting that, that our ADMs uh, in this next budget, like they were in the previous budget, are, are actually uh, are actually down, which which means Shippensburg will actually see a slight reduction in cost. That the overall cost is going up, but our but our percentage will will, will go down slightly. Um, it's about eighteen thousand dollars that that we'll see. But the other thing that I think this slide r really shows is the 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 significance of this. You know, we, we, we talk about partnerships, and I think our partnerships uh, with the, within the community are, are so important with the university and, and, uh, and certainly uh, as, a, as a good citizen in the, in the town of Shippensburg is certainly important. And here you can see the, the, the result of this critical partnership at the Franklin County Career and Technology Center we have with our partners, Chambersburg and Fannett and Metal, Greencastle, Antrim, Tuscarora, in Waynesboro Area School District. You can see that uh, we're, we're just in sort of, I guess you'd say second place in terms of, uh, but we're pretty close to others, but we're in second place in terms of size. And, but the, the significance here is that while we, we're only bearing 16.3% um, of the budgeted cost, we're able to, to afford uh, uh, all the opportunities that exist in the entire school, all the programs and and we're, we're able to offer all those things to our, to our students um, while, uh, while bearing only 16.3% uh, of, uh, of the cost. Uh, essentially, uh, we're, we're able to, 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 to offer them what, what costs $8 million a year to operate uh, for, for our contribution, which is, which is less than a million. Um, the, the next thing that I wanna just briefly uh, mention uh, is uh, that uh, the, the Franklin County Career and Technology Center will, will be applying for a new grant, um, which is coming from the Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry. It's a $2 million total for funding uh, in schools to work programs, and the, the uh, Career Center will be applying, will be applying for $200,000 to expand our computer integrated manufacturing precision machining uh, operations. We'll actually be looking to 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 offer um, a career and technology center education to uh, outside our area to 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 grow our um, uh, precision machining operation into Fulton and Adams counties uh, be, because we're the only ones in the area that that have the machinery in order to do so. So that's a an opportunity for for us to help. Uh, in neighboring counties as we grow our program uh, here. And the other thing is there are six partnership businesses that I'd like to mention that are, uh, that are, that are a part of this and lined up whereby we would, uh, we would use this money to offset training costs and, and so forth to sort of plant a seed uh, for potential f further growth at the Career Center, center um, in, uh, in this precision machining area. The partnership businesses include DL Martin, JLG, Manitowoc, Volvo, Burnside America, and Landis Solutions. And uh, that concludes my report tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burt. Um, I believe there was one facility, uh, one committee meeting facilities, Dr. Goats. Yeah, so on uh, last Wednesday, February 23rd, the facilities committee met. Um, 
However, since uh, we have on the agenda, on the discussion agenda later, um, pieces on the athletic stadium and the facilities project, I thought that uh, perhaps it would make more sense for me to give my report um, at that part, during that part of the agenda. Okay. During that part of the meeting. <clears throat> Not really a committee report, but I, I did want to report to the board that I did meet uh, with President Patterson from Shippensburg University and had lunch with him last week. Uh, President Patterson is here, and I, you know, greatly thank him for his hospitality. And as Mr. Burke said in his Career Center report about partnership, I think we have a uh, very willing partner on the Hill, and I think that the district and the university can have some substantial discussions about um, collaboration and cooperation well beyond Grace D. Lord's Elementary School, and I. I'm going to pull Don Hilbinger into some of that, too, as chairman of the Outreach Committee. So uh, thank you, President Patterson, for your hospitality, and I appreciate that. Um, we'll move on to the superintendent's report. Mr. President, I would first like to begin by inviting Mrs. Beer and the FFA up, and Caden gets to come back up again. <laughs> he switched seats on us, so thank you, Caden. Good evening and thank you for having us. You all, know me well as all, you all know me well already from serving as a student rep, but I also served as the FFA president. Here with me I have Bree Floor, who served as secretary, Riley Miner, who served as treasurer, Maddie Musser, who serves as reporter, and members Mitchell Musser, Chris Koek, and Kelsey Bailey. This evening we will give a quick report and update on all things we do as an FFA chapter. To start, I will report about Keystone fees. At the annual midwinter convention held this winter during the farm show, Kyla Jones and I received our Keystone fees which is the state degree and the second highest degree a member can earn. Watch my spot. Members earn this degree through qualifications and are supervised agricultural experiences, which include having put in or earned, put in or earned $1,000 or worked at least 300 hours, earned the chapter degree, been an active member for two years, had two years of ag classes, demonstrate leadership abilities, have a good schooling record, participate in a certain amount of activities, community service, and plan, and plan part of the program activities. SAEs are required as officers to earn degrees like this. For example, my SAE is titled Odd Jobs, but it's really just all the odd jobs I do for neighbors and community members, such as shoveling snow, mowing lawns, laying mulch, and other things. Kyla Jones could not be with us tonight, but here's what she had to say about her SAE. She was only a member for three years, and it took hard work and dedication to receive her degree. She has an SAE for her horses and two jobs. She pays for and, take cares, and takes care of her horses and her own, on her own. She uses her SAE to keep track of her finances to ensure her horses are well cared for. Her SAE keeps her well organized and on track, <coughs> preparing her for college and the workforce. Also at Move Winter Convention, five first year members received their FFA jackets. Jacket recipients were chosen through an application process and recognized in a time honored traditional ceremony. Mitchell Musser, Krista Koek, Brianna Hall, Isabel Menser, and Jenna Kirby all received their jackets this winter. Mitchell and Krista are actually kind enough to be here to discuss this for you. Thank you. I was one of the recipients of the FFA jacket at the Midwinter Convention this past week. It was really cool to get it at the convention and also get it with my friends. The FFA jacket means new opportunities through FFA. I'm excited to further this exploration and the opportunities the jacket will open up for us. I've been privileged to live and work on my family dairy farm my whole life. I started bottle feeding calves when I was only three years old and milking cows in a five gallon bucket because I couldn't reach the udders at five years old. I watched both of my sisters get their FFA jackets and couldn't wait to get mine too. I wanted my name on FFA jacket just like my sisters, Clarissa and Kirsten, and my dad. I'm so excited to see the opportunities come through FFA for me. Thank you, Mitchell and Krista. Next, Kelsey will discuss National FFA Week, which was held in, which was held nationally last week. FFA Week is a national event that is held every year. The first ever FFA Week started in 1947 during the week of George Washington's birthday. 
It was to celebrate the impact our first ever president had on agriculture. During the week, many FSA chapters, members, alumni, and advisors participate in many events throughout the week. Now Bree will be talking about the activities that we organize. Week is one of the busiest weeks for us in the chapter. We do all sorts of activities and events for members to participate in. We started off each day with a fact of the day that was read over the announcement. And every morning we had two FSA emblems throughout the school for students to sign and bring back for a prize. Each emblem consisted of an ag trivia question that the students answered as an opportunity to learn. We hosted a spirit week for the school to participate in. The days consisted of College Day, America Day, Camo Day, and Wearable Day. We appreciated the teachers and staff by giving them FSA notepads and delivering them breakfast. We gave the school a little insight on what we do by decorating our display case. We based our display off the FSA motto, learning to do, doing to learn, earning to live, and living to serve. After each school day, we had activities such as movie night, game night, a trip to the Carlisle Sporting Forum, and we also had an ice cream social where we also incorporated community service as we were a cause of encouragement to residents at local, local nursing homes. I would now like to call up Maddie Munkley to talk to you about the day. Thank you. The FSA Greenhouse has been doing very well this year. The horticulture class propagated many house plants in the fall, such as spider plants, and sold them as a fundraiser. This money went back into the greenhouse account and is used to pay for heating. There were also poinsettias sold as a fundraiser for the FSA. We also have a student helping with the greenhouse for her SAE project, where she will assist Mrs. Beard running the greenhouse. We are also having a spring plant sale, selling things such as Easter flowers and spring veggie plants, like cabbage, tomatoes, and peppers. Next to talk about future events is Treasurer Riley Murray. Following the excitement of National FFA Week, we are planning multiple other activities and events. We are currently planning for an end of the year banquet where we recognize our members, officers, our advisor, alumni, and other community members who have put forth their time for the FFA. Another thing we are planning and hope to begin soon is to partner with the, with the art program here at Satchers. We plan to be part of the Stitches in Time Barn Quilt Show in Franklin County in which we ha will have a student design a barn quilt for the Red Barn in front of the school. Even now, some members are preparing for this year's Ship and Joyce Day. At the fair, they'll participate in the livestock and dairy shows with their animals. These are just a few of the activities the FFA have planned so far for the start of this new year, and we are very excited to see what others we will do. This concludes our report, and as a gift from all of us to you, we have spider plants from the greenhouse and FFA notepads to give out. Thank you. Do you guys have any questions at all about anything? Thank you. Can you, uh, the, green, uh, the greenhouse. What's that? I, the greenhouse, I see it back there. What, what do you do back there? What, what does, I heard about plants. Do you grow plants all year long there? Or yeah, we do. We grow plants all year long, and uh, Mrs. Beard's horticulture class helps out. So in the springtime, when she has the horticulture class, they'll go out and you know learn about propagating the plants and all that. But we also use it for like fundraisers and stuff. So this year we had poinsettias. We sold poinsettias as a FFA fundraiser around Christmas time. So we we do use it all year round. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I know because. And we I believe earlier in the year I talked last year or so when you, you got an award or something. Is is we are the school board, is there anything we can help with your program? Because it seems to help a lot of people. Well, what I would love if you're asking me what I need for help with my program. <laughs> well superintendents superintendents <laughs> told things too. But I have, I would love a second teacher for my program. Um, if you look at the statistics, we have, I teach 208 students this year, which is, and technically all of those students are FFA members. And it is very difficult as a single teacher department to 
um, effectively serve all those, all those kids. There is many opportunities available to them that I probably, am, are, they are not getting because I'm only one person. If you look at our neighboring districts, like Big Spring, there are two and a half teachers at the high school, and they have a, um, they also have a program at the middle school, so they have three and a half teachers who teach agriculture at Big Spring. And in Chambersburg, who I know is much bigger than us, but they have three teachers at the high school and then one teacher at the middle school. So I would love to have a second teacher here and then maybe even in, down the road have a middle school program. I think that would be amazing for our kids. And it's something that, uh, that is, the greenhouse was my first goal and that I was able to accomplish that this past year. And I raised all, we raised all that money ourselves, uh, over $40,000 for it. And now my next goal before I retire, maybe even within the next year is to get a second teacher. The super, superintendent has, has brought us to our attention about about, about uh, the main need of the of, of assistance, so I was just wondering. Yeah, so that, he, has, he, has, he has told us about that that there was a need. Yeah, that would be my that would be my re, my request as a my need. That is, I think I see that as the greatest need right now. There are many many opportunities we could offer to the kids. More classes that we could offer that would be available that we could offer in house. Um, another welding class, a, a standalone welding class, a second, you know, companion animal care class more horticulture, make some classes longer instead of just nine weeks, make them two, uh, two marking periods. So um, there is, and Mrs. Woodall and I have been, work, have been working towards hopefully becoming an approved program. And as an approved program, we would get funding back and take the, the students could take the NOCTI tests and stuff. But there's a lot of work that goes into that. And that is not something that Mrs. Woodall and I feel comfortable doing with just me as the only teacher. So if we had a second teacher, then that would be our next step, would be to become an approved program. So. Okay, okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Does anybody else have any other questions? I wanted to thank Mrs. Beer and the FFA group for uh, an outstanding presentation, but we're also proud of all the work that you do outside of school. Um, it's well recognized. And um, I did want to ask uh, Caden or maybe some of the other members, could you tell us a little bit about the uh, state show, the state farm show, and how that went? And I know because we've met, and I understand the process of new members and the induction, uh, but could you explain a little bit about the, the process and getting a new jacket? Yeah, so uh, the, at the farm show, for first year, it's for first year members only to get their jackets. It's sponsored, by, it's sponsored through FFA, so they don't have to pay anything. Uh, they complete a whole application, and it has questions about, like, you know, what are your plans with FFA? Uh, what do you plan to do with your jacket? What's the jacket mean to you? Stuff like that. And so they get approved, and not everyone gets approved, but we've been lucky enough the past couple years to have everyone approved. And then it's a really nice ceremony they do at the farm show. Uh, it's held in the New Holland Arena. Everyone gets their jacket. They go put it on. But we also spend a day at the farm show too, you know, going around looking at the animals, all the exhibits and stuff like that. It's, it's a fun day. It really is. If anyone else wants to know. Thank you very much. One last question. How often should I water this? <laughs> when it gets dry. <laughs> okay. When it gets dry. <laughs> That'll help. <laughs> I, I will tell you that they do need transplanted, so um, I wanted to give you one in the smaller pots. I do. There are some available in nine and a half, like uh, hanging baskets for the sale in the spring in the greenhouse. But um, if you have a larger pot at home, I would definitely transplant it into a larger pot. But let it get when it gets dry, you need to water it, <laughs> and it needs it needs sun. You want to make sure you keep it in the sun. So, and in the summertime when it's nice outside, hang it outside. It'll do much better outside. And you can bring it back in. So thank, if anybody, anybody else have any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, uh, next I would like to invite uh, Ms. Sonia Payne, who is here joining us tonight, representing the SCRC, to talk about a partnership that we've been working on between the school district and SCRC for a Greyhound Wellness Project. Thank you. Okay, so I feel really unprepared because I don't have any presents for you. Sorry. Um, 
So my name is Sonia Payne, and I am with the Shippensburg Community Resource Coalition, known as, <clears throat> excuse me, SCRC, and I am the SCRC coordinator, and we have the, have the opportunity to um, apply for a grant from the Partnership from Better Health um, to address the mental health concerns of youth in our school district. And the reason why um, we felt that we needed to apply for this grant and seek the collaboration with the school district is because according to the uh, 2019 Pennsylvania Youth Survey, 48% of our students in the district that were surveyed in 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th grade report depressive symptoms. That is a really high percentage. Um, the, we have a higher level of depression symptoms and thoughts, such as um, I'm not good enough, um, than the surrounding counties and the state levels. We also have been hearing um, antidotal information from the school social workers, counselors, staff, teachers, that they are seeing a higher rate of mental health concerns in the students that they're working with. And we know that if we can have early identification and prevention, we can also then do interventions for those experiencing mental health concerns because it can reduce poor health outcomes later in life. So by talking with Dr. Seppo and some school social workers, we came up with the Greyhound Wellness Project. And this project has three facets of it. The first one is Gray Matter, which you have all heard about, um, and I hope you remember. But that is a support group that we've been doing in the high school. We're now in our second year of implementation. Um, and we are actually just finishing up our, hang on, our ninth group. Um, that we've done so far this year, and that is for students that are at risk of or experiencing depression or depressive symptoms, but just let me tell you that would include all of us because we're all still pretty stressed and, um, and sort of burnt out, right, from the pandemic. The, the second part of it is this mental health universal screening, and that is using a program called Terrace Metrics. And we talked with the Big Spring School District because they're currently using it. And what this health screening will do is it not only provides us with information at the individual level, but it also provides us with information for a classroom, a grade, a building, for the whole district. And so if we are able to identify early on um, that mm, this kid is starting to like have maybe some mental health concerns, we can put into place some early prevention. We also will be able to put into place interventions whenever the uh, youth is in crisis or as terrorist metrics calls them, priority one. Um, so it helps us identify those who are doing well, those who are struggling, and those that are at risk. And then what we're able to do with that is we can help those individuals. And so what we're proposing for this very first year is only to use this mental health screening tool in grades four, six, and nine. Um, and the reason for that is those are the years that they're first going into a new building. And so at that building, they will have at least one more that, that year and another year in the same building for which we can um, help them get help. Then, obviously, if we're screening all these kids and they're coming back as, let's say, priority run and at risk, we have to do something about it. However, staff probably, we know, does not have the time to do that. And so that is where this third piece comes in. It's a software program called Care Solace. And again, Big Springs is using it, and we, looked, um, we talked to them about it, and they have found it a huge help. Basically, they have staff 24-7 that calls the family and helps connect them to the mental health provider that they can see. And so what is so cool about that is that they will actually even make the appointment for the family um, and a counselor or staff can look on, on the dashboard and on the Care Solace dashboard, they can see every single time Care Solace has contacted a family. And they'll also see when the first appointment is going to be made. 
So as a social worker um, and one who has worked in, in schools before, it is really hard sometimes to get in touch with families because their schedules do not always align with our schedules. And so this is huge. They also have a database of all the providers in our area, the insurances that they take, if they do telehealth, and so they're able to quickly match it up. Right now, our social workers at the school district, their very first response is contact your insurance company to find out what providers match with you. Okay, I don't know about you, but that just like, oh, are you serious? Right, like that can be such a long call. And sometimes those that most need our help just don't have the capacity to do that. So with Care Solace, this will help not only our, the school staff, but it will also help families. The other thing with Care Solace is that it will be available to the whole district. And so that means every grade level, as well as all staff and the families of youth. And you can anonymously as a staff go in and say, I need this <coughs> service. Like let's say you need counseling for anxiety. And then you put in your um, insurance information and it will come up and it will give you um, those that are available to you. Or you can have someone staff call you and they'll call you within 72 hours and help you find the right person. Um, so it's not just looking at the helping our youth, but also our staff, which I find really exciting. Um, funding, it's about a $50,000 grant. And I gave you all um, a sheet on it about where the staff, where the money will also go. So terrace metrics is pretty low because we're only doing three grades, 2,310. Care Solace is higher because it covers the whole district, and that's 11,900. And then for the grant coordination and evaluation is 26,800, and that is for SCRC. And then supplies and materials is $1,680. The grant is renewable for up to three years. Um, and if funded, the great thing about this is that we can pilot these two programs without it coming out of your budget to see if it really works, right? So we already know that gray matter works, but as far as terrorist metrics and care solace for our school district, it will be really wonderful to know if this does really work for us so that we can say, hey, wow, this is, gonna, this is making a difference over the next couple of years. Um, just imp implementation of the grant would be the advisory committee will oversee the implementation and assessment of the project, and that committee is going to be formed by um, a variety of people, such as parents, school staff, um, and parents, school staff, community organizations for um, behavioral health, as well as SCRC university staff will be on, and faculty will be on it as well. And then terrorist metrics and care solace, that will be implemented primarily by um, the school district staff, such as the counselors and the social workers. Grant report and tracking is on SCRC. And then continuing to facilitate the Gray Matter Group, that's already a partnership between the school district and SCRC, and we're hoping that that will continue as well. Okay, that was a, like such a mouthful, I feel. What are your questions? When will you be hearing about the uh, grant? Okay, so we have a phase one is when they contact us and it's in the middle of March to ask if, um, to ask us more questions. So it'll be like a face-to-face -face or over Zoom interview and final decisions are made April 15th. So implementation will be happening right at next school year. However, the advisory committee will meet before the school ends so that we can have things in place so that we can do the health screening soon after we start the school year. So we have a full year to be able to um, help the students with interventions. Another cool thing about this program is that it also, Terrace Metrics actually comes with um, programs, like simple 15 minute little things that you can do with classrooms or a grade to help with um, prevention. Or if you see a class is struggling with like, let's say, ostracism, they have lessons on that that a teacher could implement. And it's research-based. It's um, been really well researched. So. 
So I, I don't have any questions, but I just wanted to say that I, I really appreciate the, um, I really appreciate this in general, and I also really appreciate the evidence-based approach that you're outlining. I mean, not only are you implementing um, stuff that has, uh, you know, evidence to back up that it's valuable elsewhere, but you're taking an evidence-based approach locally um, to test and, uh, and evaluate, uh, and I, I really appreciate that. Thank you, yeah, and actually the evaluation of this is going to be done or led by two um, social work faculty members at the university. And so they're spearheading that and they have a good bit of it, experience in research, so we're, we're blessed to be able to have them help us. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, once again, thank you for the partnership with SCRC and the connection to the university. Another example of how um, together we can accomplish so much more. We look forward to hopefully hearing some positive feedback regarding the grant. Um, even though you didn't bring us a plant tonight, that would be great news. So thank you. Thank you. Board members, next I would like to invite um, Ms. Krista Akers, she is the SASH's co coordinating and business, excuse me, SASH's co-op coordinator and business teacher. She will be sharing with us the career focused highlights from their comprehensive counseling plan. Krista actively works with our students and staff to provide opportunities for them to explore careers um, high in demand and explore all of the careers that are available locally to our students. Krista. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Suppo and Mrs. Luffy for giving me this opportunity to speak to you this evening regarding the career initiatives at the high school. Currently, we offer cooperative education, field trips and site visits, guest speakers, and job shadows to our students. Uh, cooperative education is offered to our seniors and juniors. One of the main requirements of this program is that the student's job must align with their college and or career goals. Some other requirements that would apply to any student who participates in the program is that we like to see them working a minimum of 15 hours per week for a minimum of three days per week. In addition to going to their job site, they also complete academic assignments virtually through Google Classroom. Beyond these requirements, it kind of depends a little bit on each individual student as to the more specific details of their experience. Um, some students have paid positions while others are volunteers. Um, some students work for one marking period while some st other students work the entire school year. Um, some students work one block a day, whereas by the fourth marking period, I will also have several students who actually will be out on co-op for the entire school day. So there is a little bit of flexibility depending on each student's unique situation. Um, we have had many, um, a great deal of variety in our placements. I am happy to say Shippensburg Area School District provides many opportunities for our co-op students. You may uh, recall that recently Sydney Doyle saved a life of one of our elementary students working as a noontime aide. Um, she is in fact a co-op student. I have several others who work as the noontime aides in addition to a few in our cafeteria. A few years ago, we had a student um, volunteering with the Shippensburg New News Chronicle and she became a published author for the first time having an article printed in their newspaper. Um, JLG has been a great asset. Uh, Michael Denning Dentistry up the road has been wonderful, um, in addition to Norai Media Group and obviously several other local businesses. Moving gears to the next opportunity for our students is the various career field trips. Um, you can see the list of the trips that were taken in 2019 and 2020. Uh, the popular ones here were to hack uh, the law enforcement trip. Students even got to see a canine dog in, uh, in action. Uh, Volvo has a lot of hands-on activities for students when they go over there to visit. Um, the Hershey Theater trip was a huge hit last year as well. Probably one of the favorite trips that the students went on. And then Geisinger Health also had lots of great stations um, about the various healthcare positions. And again, students got some hands-on experience um, at different types of 
um, as you can see in the one picture, different types of uh, devices that medical students would be using. Um, for this school year, we have also already had many phenomenal field trips, including um, our first trip this year was to the Hershey RV Show, um, which the Go RVing campaign actually wrote an article on their website about our students attending that trip. Um, Turner Hydraulics was a great trip. Central Penn, the students actually even got to look inside some classrooms there. And a few of the trips the last several months have been virtual due to um, you know, COVID, uh, but we are looking back um, as the school year continues, um, we are going back to in-person trips soon. And I do have a slide here in a few minutes that will um, indicate what our upcoming opportunities are. The next option that we have for students are guest speakers. In 2019 through 2020, we had just two speakers come to the high school to present to our students, whereas we built upon that, and this year we had a guest speaker day for many students in grades nine and 10. Um, we had, I think it was approximately 10 speakers that came in to speak. Uh, physical Phoenix Physical Therapy is great. PIA or Pittsburgh Institute of Aeronautics is a good one. And the students most also enjoyed the Pennsylvania State Trooper who came to, to speak to students on that particular day as well. Um, in addition to these opportunities for students, we also offer career incentives and initiatives for our teachers in both the form of guest speakers and site visits. Uh, again, pre-COVID, we had several guest speakers that came in and spoke to the teachers to help them um, know what they should, can be promoting in their class as far as uh, careers that are, are um, high priority right now. We had Geodis, um, again, Pittsburgh Institute of Aeronautics and Wellspan. And then throughout the last several years, teachers have also been going on site visits to see firsthand the jobs in action at these locations, such as, again, Martin's Potato Rolls, Pittsburgh Institute of Aeronautics, um, JLG, Volvo, and, and Amazon, to name a few. Uh, lastly, we offer job shadowing experiences. This career initiative can be offered to students in grades 9 through 12. Um, who choose to spend a day um, as like an educational field trip out job shadowing a organization. Um, Phoenix Physical Therapy is up here again. They have been a phenomenal um, contact for me and, and do a great job with our students. Um, and again, our own district classrooms have held lots of students um, in addition to an engineering for firm in the Chambersburg area. When I am trying to determine who should go on these trips and or who should see these guest speakers. Um, I use our Smart Futures data. So with the guidance comprehensive plan, we use the Smart Futures database. So I can pull up each student and see what their interests are and align which field trips would um, fit each students from that data. One of the most valuable resources to me has been our Partnership for Career Development, or PCD organization that we are a member of. They are the organization that actually does put together a lot of the field trips that I take students on, and then also they have many networking events that I attend that I have also made the contacts. Like for example, the RV show came about from a contact that I met at the PCD events. So that is definitely a variable resource that we have. And then last school year, I participated in the Leadership Cumberland program, where again, that was a huge networking opportunity for me where I have met many individuals who have now come back and provided our guest speaker days and those type of events. Um, lastly, um, coming up in the next several months, on March 10th, I have a Lunch and Learn with Trooper Clinton. He will be coming to speak to our driver's ed class in addition to, again, some of those students who indicate in Smart Futures that they're interested in law enforcement. And he will actually be doing a mock traffic stop for the students so that, again, as part of driver's ed, students get to see what happens if they were ever to be pulled over. March 25th, we have a veterinary science trip. March 31st, um, I just found out today um, that this trip has now been opened in person for all grades. So hopefully I can get a few more students down to the Pittsburgh Institute of Aeronautics. 
Um, also, tomorrow, our Health Career Institute applications are due, um, and the Live Event Career Day applications are due. And then March 11th, very similar to the HCI program, Holy Spirit also has a career exploration program, and those applications are due March 11th. Um, to, again, as I mentioned, to pinpoint which students should go to these events, I use Smart Futures, and then I also email out the entire student body. Um, obviously, I mean, if it's only a ninth grade activity, I'm only going to email the ninth grade, but I email students with the, these opportunities and have them email me back and or visit me in the classroom to sign up for them. Some trips, we also pull the Smart Futures data and just hand select who goes on them. Um, I have found throughout the years that sometimes the students aren't, you know, the, the best to get the information out to. Um, they drag their feet. They don't think it pertains to them. So I have also um, created a Facebook page that I'm hoping this gets the information out to the parents. So on Facebook, it is Shippensburg High School Career Corner, and I try to post the um, career trips and job opportunities so that hopefully um, the parents see the information and encourage their sons and daughters to participate. Um, thank you for your time this evening, and does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I had a question. How many um, current co-op students do you have? Uh, currently, so far this year, I have approximately 45. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank we you. appreciate the presentation. Thank you, Krista. Thank you. Krista, I think back to my high school experience, was, which was a few years ago. And just the, the opportunities and the exposure that you help provide our students is amazing. Um, you know, the, it, back in the day, we didn't know what was out there. And, and if we did, we weren't sure if we were gonna like it or not. So you had to commit yourself and spend a lot of time. So many students, you know, would spend time at, uh, you know, whether it's a technical school or career, uh, career school or, uh, you know, college, university. And then find out they're, they're in something they really didn't like. So providing these opportunities, I think, is just a tremendous asset for our school district. And we thank you for all your work. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, uh, next I'd like to read the donation report. Shippensburg Area School District Board of Directors acknowledges receipt of donations from the following individuals or groups. <laughs> Donorschoose.org, a Dell Inspiration, 5,000. Uh, was purchased a two-in-one unit 14-inch touchscreen laptop for use in the special education classroom at James Bird Elementary School. Approximate value of the donation was $690.58. And the Franklin County Farm Bureau books for use in the library at the Shippensburg Area Intermediate Unit. Approximate value of the donation $43.93. Mr. President, that concludes the superintendent report. Thank you. We'll move on to the consent agenda. 4A is the approval of minutes for the February 14th meeting. 4B is your finance reports. 4C, personnel. The administration recommends the following temporary new appointment. Virginia Lopez, assistant high school principal. Professional staff administration recommends acceptance of the following resignations for the purposes of retirement. Sean Chapelli, guidance counselor at James Bird Elementary School. Gail Holt, three third grade teacher at Nancy Grayson. Administration recommends approval of the following absence request. Rhonda Fouts, learning support teacher. Support staff, the administration recommends approval of the following resignations. Jennifer Armold, cash, cafeteria cashier helper at James Bird. Virginia ba Victoria Baker, I'm sorry, substitute health roommate. And Hannah Wyrick, substitute custodian. Administration recommends approval of the following new appointment. Jessica Robert, part-time classroom assistant at the intermediate school. Administration recommends approval of the following transfer. Hannah Witzel, Shippensburg Area full-time custodian at the middle school to part-time classroom assistant at the middle school. Supplemental staff, administration recommends approval of the following new appointment. Brad Horgos, Shippensburg Area Middle School co-assistant athletic director. Administration recommends approval of the following after-school tutoring appointment at $25 per hour. Michael Delay. 4D, <coughs> senior class trip. Administration recommends approval of the following uh, 2022 class trip to Pittsburgh. That'll take place on Friday, May 20th. 
4E is your 2022-2023 school calendar. 4F is the affiliation agreement between Shippensburg University and the school district for the Grace B. Lores Elementary School. 4G is the summer academy. And 4H is public relations communication intern. Would any board member like to take any item separate? And I am going to take 4F separate. Any others? Is there a motion to approve for A, B, C, D, E, G, and H? Red Scott, I make a motion we accept all those. Motion made by Mr. Scott. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Everly. Roll call. Mr. Dwayne Burt. Yes. Mr. Levi Kressler. Yes. Mrs. Stephanie Everly. Yes. Dr. Nathan Goats. Yes. Mr. Don Hilbinger. Yes. Mr. Fred Scott. Yes. Mr. Jim Bard. Yes. Mr. Charlie Suters. Yes. Mr. Mark Butterball. Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Christy. Four. F is the affiliation agreement between Shippensburg University and the school district. Um, before we take a motion and vote, uh, I'm going to invite Dr. Patterson down to have a few words. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to the members of the board for allowing me to uh, address you today regarding uh, Grace B. Lohr's Elementary School. As the interim president of Shippensburg University, I take great pride in the stewardship of the institution and by extension, being a good steward of our community. When we have educational institutions, whether it is intermediate schools, high schools, middle schools, and universities, we can only be strong together. If one is weak, we are strong, we are a weaker community as a whole. And as I leave this institution, I am intimately involved in not just strengthening the institution, but strengthening our community and the service that I provide in the, in the community, whether it's the downtown revitalization that's going on uh, in, concert, in concert with our uh, university, but also being good stewards and partners with our school district. And the university itself, in the most recent economic impact study, churns about $275 million a year in this community. And it's our job to create a stronger environment for that institution and thus to benefit the community. And I could speak to you today about Grace B. Lurie's Elementary School, but I would be remiss if I didn't turn this mic, with your permission, sir, over to our dean, of Education and Human Services, Dr. Nicole Hill, who was responsible for the stewardship of this community asset. So if I can, Dr. Hill. Thank you, President Patterson, and thank you so much for welcoming us this evening. So as Dean of the College of Education and Human Services, um, I think about the impact we have with this idea of leadership through service. And that's exactly what the Lab School affords us, is an opportunity to have a positive impact on our entire community, our youth, and also to really transform the lives of future educators. One of the things that we recognize is that across the nation, and specifically in the Commonwealth, there's a crisis in terms of teacher shortages. And we at Shippensburg University have continued to grow and expand um, the number of educators that we graduate. That is a significant legacy for us that is really important to us. So the job growth rate for teachers in our area is about 8.3% annually, which exceeds the national average. And that's really important because it's something that we have to do to create um, supports for the community and really have a positive impact on the children that we serve. At Grace B. Lores University Elementary School, uh, we're the only public lab school in the Commonwealth, and in conversations with Holly Garner, we haven't been able to identify another public institution and partnership like this in the nation currently. So we're very proud of it. It's a significant pride point for me as dean. I did want to emphasize that um, when we talk about education at the university level, preparing future teachers, we bring our students, our university students, into the lab school in math methods course, science methods course, they're doing observation hours, field placements. Just in this academic year so far, we've had 1,700 students at the university who've engaged with the 131 elementary students that we serve. 
Um, Ninety percent of those elementary students are community um, members, so with only 10 percent are university faculty and staff children, and that's something we're really proud of. We also significantly contribute as a university um, $2 million in the past three years to the lab school, and that's something we're very proud of. We think it evidences our commitment to um, the school district and to our community. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Patterson, Dr. Hill. I appreciate it. Is there a motion to approve 4F? Dwayne Burt, so moved. Moved by Mr. Burt. Is there a second? Fred Scott, second. Second by Mr. Suters. Roll call. <coughs> Mr. Levi Kressler. Yes. Mrs. Stephanie Eberly. Yes. Dr. Nathan Goats. Yes. Mr. Don Hilbinger. Yes. Mr. Fred Scott. Yes. Mr. Jim Bard. Yes. Mr. Dwayne Burt. Yes. Mr. Charlie Suters. Yes. Mr. Mark Butterball. Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Christy. Move on to the action agenda. 5A is approval of Boyo va Transportation Van Driver. Nelson Heberlig, is there a motion to approve? Fred Scott, a motion. Make motion, motion made by Mr. Scott. Is there a second? Second. Second by Dr. Goats. Discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Stephanie Aberly. Yes. Dr. Nathan Goats. Yes. Mr. Don Hilbinger. Yes. Mr. Fred Scott. Yes. Mr. Jim Bard. Yes. Mr. Dwayne Bart. Yes. Mr. Levi Kressler. Yes. Mr. Charlie Suters. Yes. Mr. Mark Butterball. Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Christy. 5B is your federal programs conference. Is there a motion to approve 5B? So moved. Moved by Dr. Goats. Is there a second? Second. Fred Scott seconds. Second by Mr. Suters. Discussion? Roll call. Dr. Nathan Goats. Yes. Mr. Don Hilbinger. Yes. Mr. Fred Scott. Yes. Mr. Jim Bard. Yes. Mr. Dwayne Bart. Yes. Mr. Levi Kressler. Yes. Mrs. Stephanie Everly. Yes. Mr. Charlie Suters. Yes. Mr. Mark Butterball. Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Christy. Mo move on to the discussion agenda. Uh, <laughs> six A, B, and C are probably going to have discussion. So. Um, and B. Well, I guess all these are. 6F is the request to form Greyhounds Unified Bocce Boosters. Um, that'll appear on the next agenda for approval. Does any members uh, have any questions for the administration on 6F? 6G is a field trip request change. Second graders requesting to attend the Harrisburg Center's baseball game and Colonel Denning State Park has a field trip in place of their board approved trip to King's Gap. Any questions for the administration? Just a note to board members, if you could scratch uh, the Senator's baseball game that has uh, been removed from that. Thank you. 6H is the designation of depository series of 2022. Any discussion? All right. So let's go back up and we'll start with 6A and 6B and I assume we'll take those jointly since they're kind of tied together. Um, I believe we'll start with Dr. Goats who has a facilities report. Yeah, thank you. So uh, as I mentioned before, the facilities committee met on Wednesday, February 23rd. Uh, there were representatives present uh, from k w Engineering uh, as well as SiteLogic. Uh, the uh, representative from k w um, presented a sort of more formal um, version of a plan that we have already seen, um, but uh, there were some slight revisions, um, and uh, the board members all have a copy of uh, the presentation that she gave, several, several pages um, describing um, the work. Um, I, uh, I don't know how much detail we want to talk about this, but if you, if you sort of, you know, flip to the end, the last two pages, three pages, I guess, because we're printed on both sides of the paper. Um, you can see uh, the, uh, she's calling it the, the preliminary opinion of probable construction costs. Um, and, um, well, if you flip one page earlier, Exhibit A, just if you need a refresher on what it is, what the project is that they're moving forward with, or at least that this plan has, has to do with, you can, you can see the picture. And then we have these probable construction costs, and you can, um, I mean, you can peruse this yourself. 
and, uh, and see where this is headed. Um, if you uh, go to the end, you'll see an estimated site work construction cost of nearly $9 million for this project. Um, it is important to note that uh, I, I believe both KW and SiteLogic emphasized that um, a lot of this, a lot of the, uh, the estimates that are being made here are based on um, past work and do not necessarily reflect the inflationary environment in which we are in, which some materials may be difficult to acquire and there may be other sort of inflationary impacts. So uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, by all accounts, an optimistic estimate of what uh, of this project would cost. Um, and I just want to highlight in particular the stormwater management piece because that is a, um, a point of concern for this community, let's put it that way. Um, this stormwater management estimate uh, reflects, uh, I believe in the engineer's words, um, an estimate based on similar projects of scope. Um, does not account at all for uh, the particulars of our area. So it's quite possible that that piece alone um, could balloon substantially um, as, uh, as or if we move forward with that project. So um, the, uh, as far as this goes, the, um, the committee did, does not, uh, did not come to sort of any recommendations um, for the larger board. I think that um, we, we learned a lot. Uh, we asked a lot of questions. Uh, I think that um, we're, we're sort of learning to ask better questions and what questions to ask uh, as we're working through this. Um, I, I, again, this is not a formal recommendation, but I think there was consensus um, from the committee uh, that, um, that there's, a, there's a budget and finance piece um, that, that needs to go with this. Um, that we, um, I mean, we have some money set aside. There might be some other monies in, in fund budget that are, or in fund balance that are available um, but, uh, but, but maybe, maybe the right, and again, this is not a formal recommendation, but sort of consensus among the, the three of us, that maybe the approach, uh, the right approach to take is for us to set a budget for uh, the project and then ask uh, our engineers um, to engineer within that budget. So I'll leave that there um, for you to chew on. Um, the next piece, uh, the rest of the facilities, um, SiteLogic came, um, they uh, provided a very large packet um, of information. Um, the small packet that you have in front of us, I think that Chad's going to talk about this later. Is Chad still here? Yes. Okay. No, I just not seeing him. Um, so Chad's going to talk about that later. It was a larger packet of information that looked similar to what we have seen before that um, the large uh, spreadsheet that included, you know, things that need to be done right now, things that can be uh, done by the district later, and things that can be pushed off to the future. We saw a revised version of that. Uh, it wasn't substantially revised, but it was somewhat revised. Um, it was, uh, again, sort of the kind of understanding that there was a lot of information there to digest, and it was difficult for the board to, to prioritize. Um, so um, uh, the, the, the folks the representatives from SiteLogic, I apologize for forgetting their names. Um, but uh, they were going to work uh, together with Chad and perhaps the superintendent uh, between now and uh, a next um, uh, facilities committee meeting um, to, to continue to review these projects. And as I understood it, to, to create a, a sort of better decision-making matrix of sort of either-or decisions. Um, based on, you know, sort of further revised priorities. Um, there was a desire uh, for us to, uh, you know, sort of continue to have budget and finance meetings, you know, sort of along with this so that we can put these pieces together. Um, so our, uh, and then uh, there's, there's an additional, I apologize for not um, taking complete notes on this. Maybe Dr. Seppel can help out, but there was, there's an additional piece in, uh, March, 
that uh, SiteLogic's going to need to return for board approval on a, on, a, on a sort of additional move forward with the with the with the project, uh, and so we asked uh, that um, uh, they present that first to the the. Um, the facilities committee and, and they thought that was a great idea so we could sort of hash that out prior to coming to the full board um, and then that will also give us a chance to meet uh, as a budget and finance committee and sort of see that picture uh, and to be able to put some of this in context so um, again no definite recommendations from this group but we do have a, a sort of uh, way forward uh, I think there was some helpful discussion uh, more questions than answers perhaps um, but um, yeah, that's where we're headed. Thanks. Thanks. Before we um, before we ask any questions, why don't we have since this is all part of it, why don't we have Chad come up for? Yeah, and uh, Dr. Goetz, the piece you talked about in March with uh, coming back uh, with some additional information, Chad will touch base on that very quickly. So I, really what I was going to go over is some of the phases of work and where we currently are. Uh, you know, we're doing the early building renovation work, and that's going to be starting in 2022. Uh, design, we started that in November and then going through spring. Um, we put that in bed in February, and that bedding will be completed March 16th. Uh, the biggest thing is, is again, I talked about this last time, is the consideration consideration of early Giza award for bidding out for bid. That they're going to bring that to you April 11th meeting, um, and what that is is that's going to give us early procurement and order parts and order stuff that we need, so we can uh, kind of eliminate this cost inflation. So that's that's going to be uh, one of the biggest things we have available, um, and then. The, the other thing coming up is fall 2022 through the summer 2023. There's going to be designs for the new construction. This is for like the actual addition to the buildings. Um, they're going to bid that out late summer 2022 through early fall. And the remaining work will be starting in the fall of 2022 through 2023 summer. Um, and then this one, the site work is for summer 23 and hopefully they start that early. Uh, the biggest thing that I am in the middle of doing now, and we just started that today, was uh, what uh, Dr. Goetz talked about, was uh, reviewing the district line scopes. We're going through that line by line. Some of those have already been done, um, and through current changes, we're making some different prioritization on those right now. Um, that's going to take us probably about a week. I'll probably work on that this whole week. And, and then I, what I'm doing with that information is I'm taking that and giving that to Melissa, and Melissa is going to uh, update the entire uh, the entire sheet so everybody has a new updated sheet. Any other questions on this? Questions for Chad? Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Any um, questions or comments from board members regarding uh, Dr. Goetz's report we obviously got a lot of work to do yeah I'm just gonna add one more piece while I've added so I just the visual aid you guys all had we received something that looked like this earlier and this is the this is my revised copy that we got on Wednesday um, which is not significantly different but it is different and one of the things I wanted to point out if if you remember we looked at some um, we looked at some figures before that had like a picture of the middle school and the high school and different construction projects were shaded in different colors. And you remember that we made a decision that we were gonna go forward with a piece of what was recommended for the middle school. So that's, you know, these, this extra classroom wing and this revised cafeteria, right? So we've already approved the funding, we've approved, you know, $10 million of bond, and then we're adding this $4 million of ESSER funding, and that's going forward. Now, it's important to note that, so, you know, we've, we've kind of, We've, we've, we've sort of got this $49 million figure um, as, as a sort of possible target for what we can spend. Uh, we've committed $10 million of that. Uh, 
what fits in the rest of that 39 million? Like, the, like, like there's lots of things that could fit in there, but, but not presently part of the recommended projects are anything else going on at the middle school. So I, I just say that to kind of highlight this, right? Because there's some conversation about, you know, a lot of other needs at the middle school. For instance, uh, the administrative suite is in serious need of, uh, of um, I don't know, restructuring. Uh, and then there was, uh, you know, talk of the, 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 the band and orchestra area, uh, that that definitely needed some, some work. Um, that is presently like not in the list of recommended projects. So if we were to take on projects like that, which we may very well decide we want to do, that means excluding either other presently recommended projects or you know, finding the money from somewhere else, borrowing more money or whatever. So I just, I don't know. I mean, it, it's a very big task. There, there's a lot of decisions to be made. It's not gonna be easy to make these decisions, but I, I just, I don't know, in, in sort of rec, in coming to that realization that what I just shared with you, which may have been obvious to you, but wasn't to me um, and, until really Wednesday, like it just, it sort of highlighted kind of how lean, right? I mean, there's so many things we want to do, uh, so many things we feel like we need to do and, uh, and very, uh, you know, sort of limited resources to do those things. So um, I guess the facilities committee will continue to meet regarding this. Nathan? The facilities, facilities committee will intend to meet or will meet and it's our, <laughs> our intention certainly to provide recommendations as we come upon them. But I mean, it's hard to do, right? I mean, I, I think that these are decisions that clearly the whole board is going to have to decide on. These aren't, you know, it's not a matter of, I don't think anyone on the committee thinks, oh, we're going to make a recommendation, the board's just going to go with it, right? I mean, I, I think that we're trying to distill the information in, in sort of bite-sized pieces so that we can give that to the, to the board to digest those pieces and make a decision as a whole, because these decisions are not, these decisions are bigger than just the three people on the committee. Understood. Just a, a few additional comments, <clears throat> if I could. First of all, I'd like to, to thank uh, the facilities committee. Uh, in, in my mind, uh, I know I know they're gonna they, they've got a lot of work ahead of them, but I know they're gonna do an excellent job. Uh, in in my opinion, we have we have some of our best thinkers um, uh, on that committee. It just just to highlight uh, and say in a different way, perhaps the challenges. If you, if you weren't at the meeting or, or, or for the audience, perhaps. But, but essentially, um, they, they broke down the, the work for us, um, the, the uh, engineers. Yeah, they broke down the work for us. They gave us a group of projects that they said need to be done now uh, in project sense that total $53 million, plus an additional $7 million worth of projects they said need to be done now by the school district. Now you're at 60, and and as Dr. Goats mentioned, uh, and and they presented a uh, a stadium complex that that is nine million dollars, and uh, and and so real quickly, if if you borrowed up to 49 million, not that we should, but if you did, 69 minus 49 leaves 20, so we're 20 short. We have two earmarked in fund balance for a stadium. That, that, that takes you perhaps to 18 short, and, um, and then the plan to use $4 million in ESSER money, that, that brings you down to $14 million short. So clearly, um, it won't all fit. And, and on top of that is p potential additional work at the, uh, at the middle school. Um, it, so um, the other thing that, that Dr. Goat certainly did point out, but he said that, that they're, they're now seeing uh, they're seeing inflation that we haven't seen in a long time uh, that could could impact these numbers by between 10 to 20 percent. Well, 20 percent on 50 million dollars is is uh, potentially another 10 million dollars. So we're going to have to somewhere along the way we're going to have to get real with with uh, prioritization. The the last thing I do want to mention uh, because it it seems like it's my favorite topic. Uh, but but um, at the end of the meeting, uh, sort of in sidebar with the committee, 
um, there was a brief discussion about land. <coughs> and uh, of course, when I, look, when I look at the campus here, I think, I think we're tight on land. Um, and depending upon, uh, depending upon how you look at it. As that conversation progressed, we wound up imagining that we're 20 years from now. After, after uh, of course, th these projects address the 20 year look out. Now we're 20 years from now. And, and the very first words uh, out, of, out of the gentleman's mouth uh, as it relates to uh, the, the needs 20 years from now uh, at the high school, because we clearly don't have the money to build another high school. He said, well, if these weren't athletic fields, and of course they're athletic fields, at to, to which I said, ding, 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 ding. Um, so I, I think any, um, any uh, 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 approach that we, that we take uh, in this, this next 20 years needs to, uh, needs certainly to, uh, to consider the long, long range uh, uh, space needs, land needs of, uh, of the high school. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Let me get a grip where we were. Um, 6E is site consolidation. Um, this is on the discussion agenda. If you have any questions regarding that, um, please get them to the administration before the, um, before the next meeting. Move on to 6C, the health and safety plan. Administration is recommending modifying the health and safety plan to eliminate the six foot social distancing requirement for students when eating lunch and breakfast beginning March 7th, 2022. Approved by the board, students would return to eating in cafeteria sp spaces in all buildings with students seeing you prior to the pandemic. Um, does, um, when you say removing the social distancing, are you talking about just lunch or in general? For instance, um, I don't think that students are still using lockers all at one time. Is, am I accurate in saying that? The, um, I know, well, each building is a little bit different. Um, the high school, uh, any student that wants a locker is, is able to get one. Um, I believe we had a question at the intermediate building because they, there were some classrooms who um, they, just, they had smaller classes so they didn't feel the need to use them. But um, we have since asked them to designate lockers for all students. And then um, at the, media, at the uh, middle school, um, again, students uh, do have lockers or, or have access to lockers. So social distancing really at this point um, when it comes to six feet is uh, for the most part really in the cafeteria areas and the eating areas. Um, that, again, that looks a little bit different at the building, um, at your elementary buildings because of the lack of space. Um, you'll have students who are social distanced in the cafeteria or some students who are eating within their classrooms. Um, again, at the intermediate school, it might look a little bit different. Um, with some of the seating arrangements um, at the high school or middle school. They have other designated areas areas that we've been utilizing um, for students. So at this point, the administration is recommending the removal of the social distancing requirement for uh, breakfast and lunch so that we can return to a normal uh, cafeteria look. Thank you. So you... you this is on the discussion agenda, our, um, but, but the, the idea was for this to go into effect March 7th? Well, Mr. Goetz, I put that, uh, doc, excuse me, Dr. Goetz, I put that on there just so that we give, uh, we can uh, make it look however we want. Um, I, what I didn't want was a, an effective immediately um, because that creates a little bit of chaos as far as planning and some of the things that we need to do at the building. So really the date's not so, so, so significant to me as much as it is 
as it is that we um, give ourselves a little bit of time administratively and logistically to work out moving things back if the board so desires. And this wasn't on the agenda, obviously, because the agenda was set on Thursday or before, but, um, but of course there's been these questions about the change in transportation um, recommendations, masking on transportation. So um, I'm just, I guess, curious to know what the administration's recommendation is in regards to managing that situation. Yeah, so uh, you're right. I mean, the, the uh, board agenda was published prior to um, that, that uh, change in the CDC guidelines, but our recommendation would be, as it has always been, and to follow the CDC guidelines. So is that something that needs a policy change, or is that just a matter of... I, I think happen? it would be good practice to make a... Uh, uh, to have that as part of a motion. Uh, I realize that, again, that that's not on the agenda. Uh, we've had some talk about that in the past, but um, at some point, if, if the, uh, again, if the board is so inclined, that would be my recommendation. Well, um, while I'm talking, I got my voice warmed up, I'm just going to add something else here. So um, I certainly understand uh, the desire to, to sort of move forward with these um, changes, and I can support a motion to do so. Um, however, I mean, I've, I've honestly been very frustrated uh, the past several meetings um, with uh, the practice of pulling things, making motions of action off of issues that are on the discussion agenda. Uh, and I recognize the pandemic has provided unique situations and sometimes we've had to make emergency decisions. Um, but uh, as a, you know, school director, uh, it's, you know, I, I mean, I, I think I think it is definitely best practice for uh, this board and others to have items, you know, sort of listed on the agenda that can be, you know, sort of seen and discussed beforehand and, and, and public input can be taken before we take action. Now, I recognize you had, you know, abs you know no, no control over the, the you know, <laughs> when the CDC comes through with changes of recommendations, that's sort of a unique situation. Um, uh, so I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't like this procedure. I don't like uh, that we're sort of continuing to, to take, make these kinds of procedural actions. I think, it's, uh, I think it's inappropriate. And if it's been done in the past and, and if I've been a party to that, I certainly uh, want to you know, sort of correct those errors. Um, but uh, that said, uh, I can certainly support um, these changes. I, w I would agree with you, Dr. Goetz. Um, I would say the exception here, as you pointed out, is the fact that those guidelines were just changed on Friday. And so I think that's the circumstance that creates a little bit of a different scenario. Um, but uh, again, that, that will be up to the board. Uh, just another question or two. I, I believe what, what's spelled out here in the agenda, which is the elimination of the six feet, that's consistent. Um, is it not with the uh, rev revision uh, of the, the CDC to, uh, to, to eliminate that, to, 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 to go back to three feet? Is, isn't that correct? I don't believe the CDC, and I'm, I'm going to look to Mrs. Martin, but I don't think they've changed that at this point, have they? The, my, um, so I, I thought I thought I did. Oh, oh but, but you, okay. I thought I did. Okay. I again I I I didn't see that 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 was changed. My thought on it was common sense is if you're going to have kids on a school bus, not requiring a mask, what would be the difference between that and and. Um, Eating in, a, eating in a cafeteria where they were next to each other. So that makes sense. Um, but I can't, I can't acknowledge that that was an actual change from the CDC. So one more question. If we were to make a motion in regards to transportation, I know we don't like immediate effect um, things and, and point taken. I think that we put our administrators and parents uh, in a very bad situation um, by making an immediate change two weeks ago. Um, 
So what would be your recommendation in regards to timing of the transportation change? If there was a, if there was a motion tonight, um, I would prefer to make the changes by um, the 7th. That just that doesn't mean it will take that long, but it gives us a couple of days, again, just to, to work things out, move tables around, logistics, and put things in place. And that may look different at each building, certainly. But, but for the transportation piece? Um, I, I think, that, I mean, if you wanted to do that sooner, that could be done in a couple of days. We'll just put a notice out to parents to inform them of the changes, as well as inform, we want to inform our bus contractor uh, and bus drivers so they're aware of the changes as well. So would it be reasonable to make a motion to empower you to make the decision, to, <laughs> to make these changes by March 7th, but at a, a, a date that's up to administration's discretion? I, I would be fine with that. Uh, then I move that, uh, that we accept administration's um, proposal in regards to um, the uh, eliminating the six-foot social distancing requirement for lunch and breakfast um, uh, by, uh, by March 7th, uh, as well as uh, updating our transportation policy to um, match current CDC recommendations um, at, uh, you know, sometime before March 7th, but uh, at the discretion of administration to announce. Is that clear enough? Dwayne Burke, second. Dr. Goetz motions to eliminate, uh, <laughs> accept the administration's recommendation uh, to eliminate social distancing for students when eating lunch and breakfast beginning March 7th and updating the transportation in accordance with the CDC before March 7th with the administration's discretion. Is that an appropriate? Yeah, as, as to the exact date. Yeah. Motion is made by Dr. Goats and is seconded by Mr. Burke. Discussion from the board? Dr. Seppo, does it really, uh, is, is, is a week, I mean, to get communication to bus drivers? I understand the lunch aspect, like in logistics and all of that, but to get communication to the school bus drivers for to not have masks tomorrow, we did it for summer school over the summer, effective immediately, and uh, an email and a connect ed call reaches out to all families. I understand, you know, if, if tonight is too late, uh, but even if it's, you know, give it even 24 hours, but I think a week is definitely um, a lot. It's more than enough time. I, I, if, if you heard something different, I think that was what I was trying to indicate to Dr. Goetz as we talked about the two separate pieces, one being the coordination of changing the cafeterias over and the other being the communication and change for masks on transportation. I don't anticipate or, or uh, it is not my plan for that to take a week. I just don't right. like effective immediately because I think that puts people in a bad position. So I think it is fair to give us a little bit of time. I don't, again, plan on that taking till the 7th. One other comment, I, I'd just like to, uh, to echo the comments that Dr. Goetz made <clears throat> in regard to the, uh, the, the standard practice or, or it becoming standard practice or wholesale uh, movement of discussion items to, uh, to action agenda. Um, that happened uh, uh, recently in, in a couple of cases. The, the only, and and it, really, it really isn't even fair to the public in terms of giving the public notice on, on a couple of those items that were, that were done, in my opinion. And this effective immediately business, um, I think it, it went over like a lead balloon with some of our partners, too, and we need to take great care of our, of our partnerships um, it, it, here in the, in the school district uh, and with, with, uh, with the outside. But that said, um, because, because this is spelled out in the agenda, because it does it does move to, uh, to follow CDC recommendations. There, it, it really makes no sense to me to, uh, I'll use the word punish, uh, the, the system by not, by not moving, not having enough flexibility to move, to move quickly uh, to, to adjust either going into a pandemic or, or, or fortunately and hopefully coming out of a pandemic. 
So with, with that warning uh, in place, um, I certainly support this. Thank you. Any other uh, comments? I, I guess my, my only concern, I guess, is the second part <clears throat> in regards to the transportation. Um, again, I just feel it's hypocritical of me to sit here openly without a mask mandate, yet tomorrow morning we're going to tell all of our kids that they have to wear it on a bus, even though that changed what will be 72 hours ago from federal guidelines. So I, I understand the argument on both sides, but um, you know, I guess the question is something like this in general, um, when there's a change of, of CDC guidelines that came out Friday, um, you know, in the future, um, are we able to just make the adoption um, like some of our surrounding districts did? They've kind of spur the moment, well, not spur the moment, I should say, but um, they got the guidelines and they made changes that they took effect today. Um, and we're talking about waiting a whole week after everybody else did. Um, so that, that's my concern with that March 7th date for transportation. I don't, I don't disagree with you, Levi. And I'm not sure that why this is even, I'm not sure why the bus transportation issue even has to come back before this board when the health and safety plan, the overriding theme is to follow the recommendations of the CDC. The CDC just repealed it. So I'm not even sure why we have to vote on this and why the administration can't just say, well, here's the new CDC guideline and uh, that's what we're doing. We're following it in our health and safety plan. Um, I'm not sure why it would take days to tell people that they don't have to wear a mask on a bus. Um, I, you know, I, I understand with the uh, social distancing, I understand all the organization that has to go into that and respect the administration in, in that regard. But, um, it, it just doesn't make sense to me that we're Every, everywhere you look in the health and safety plan, follow the CD, CDC, follow the CDC. The CDC makes masks optional on buses, and we have to wait for the board to act. It just doesn't make any sense. Well, that argument would make more sense to me if we were actually following CDC guidelines according to, uh, you know, about masking like a week ago. But, you know, this board gave up following the CDC guidelines regarding masking, so Clearly, we decided that we haven't been following the health and safety plan since we implemented. Well, uh, Mr. President, I'll, I'll, I'll agree to just dis, uh, to disagree on that. But um, a couple of quick comments: the with regard to the CDC guidelines, I think that the reason the reason that the, the administration comes back to the board, even though the CDC has changed its guidelines, is. Just think, remember, that can go two ways, right? I mean, right now we're looking at it from a positive perspective, right? So we're looking at the, the guidelines changing to something that people are looking forward to. So people are saying, yes, oh, great, why didn't you make that change? For, because the CDC made it. Well, let's, I don't know, let's come up with some other change that the CDC would make that would be ludicrous, not that that's possible, right? ludicrous and us, uh, us implementing that just because the CDC made that change. So that's where I think, it may, we, even though it's the CDC guideline, I think where they've made a change to the to parameters, I think it makes sense to come back to the board to have that acknowledgement of yes, we, we, we agree with that. Yes, we, we want to implement that. Um, and, and then very quickly with regard to transportation, uh, I'll take the other side of this and just again, trying to think of all of our clients, all of our parents, all of our students is um, when we talk about making a change, I want those families who are concerned, who still are concerned, and, and there are plenty, and understandably, about their student being on a bus, who now are gonna be on a bus without students wearing a mask. And they, I don't know, they may want to have the opportunity to talk to their child about the importance of wearing a mask again and reinforce that. Or they may decide, hmm, maybe I wanna drive my child to school as opposed to them being on the bus because Masks aren't going to be uh, required. I don't. I don't know. I'm. I'm just saying that's where I like to make sure people have that opportunity. Um, going, looking at it from both perspectives. That's all. Thank you. I don't think it'll take a week. If it'll make everyone happier, and you want to say Wednesday, say Monday, right? Yes, Wednesday. Fine. I'm okay with that. I just don't like effective immediately. I don't immediately isn't fair to anyone. Thank you. Can I just add one more final thing? Um, 
from two weeks ago uh, when, when we made a uh, pass uh, <clears throat> regarding masking. Uh, I'm just reading the minutes here. Uh, it says the board recommends dropping all mask mandates in the district, including Jeep Blues, in compliance with federal laws re regarding transportation. So I kind of do take that, Dr. Seppo, that that would mean, like, that federal law with transportation ended. So I, I still take it as, like, we had. Now, with all due respect, I do understand your position that you just said. Um, so I would be willing to compromise, like, what's tomorrow? Tomorrow's the first. I'd be willing to compromise to like the second or the third and find something in the middle. Um, because I, I do understand your, your, your argument you made. I also understand the argument that some of the others, some of the rest of us have made too. So that's, that's kind of where I'm standing. Well, if it'll make everyone else more comfortable, I'm, I'm happy to revise the motion that the transportation piece go in effect um, March 2nd. Mr. Burt, is that amenable to you as the second? Well, I believe the superintendent just said if it would make us more happy that he, 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 could, he could meet Wednesday. Isn't that March the 2nd? It is. There you go. Any other discussion regarding the motion? All right, before we vote, I just want to, again, clarify the motion that we are accepting the recommendations of the administration regarding so, uh, eliminating social, social distancing <laughs> six feet in for eating lunch and breakfast. That will begin on March 7th. Uh, and the motion also includes optional masking uh, on bus transportation and other transportation to take effect on March 2nd. So a yes vote will be for that motion and a no vote will be against the motion. Christy, roll call. Mr. Don Hilbinger. Yes. Mr. Fred Scott. Yes. Mr. Jim Bard. Yes. Mr. Dwayne Burt. Yes. Mr. Levi Kressler. Yes. Mrs. Stephanie Everly. Yes. Dr. Nathan Goats. Yes. Mr. Charlie Suters. Yes. Mr. Mark Butterball. Yes. Motion carried unanimously. <coughs> Any other board comments on the health and safety plan at this yes. time? Yes. Actually, I do. Um, during the um, February 14th board meeting, when the board board voted six to three in favor to drop all mask mandates in the district um, to be in compliance with the federal laws with public transportation. Mr. Kressler used the verbiage, um, uh, you know, specifically because um, we have learned that verbiage um, is very important, that we have learned throughout the pandemic, um, that we know that mandates and requirements um, are used interchangeably along with um, recommendations, um, suggestions. The day after, so on February 14th, uh, students are still being required to mask after their, they've already completed their five-day quarantine. And a lot of these students are still healthy, um, asymptomatic students. So the motion said, I mean, use the word all, and all always means all always. Um, the motion was not to eliminate masks except for the quarantine guidelines and um, I would like the board, like for clarification, I did speak with um, Dr. Seppo on this and um, currently like w students are still required or mandated to wear masks throughout the district and the motion made by Mr. Kressler um, was all mask requirements and mandates throughout the district. If I could speak to that just a little bit more, thank you, Mrs. Eberly. The, um, there was a motion made to remove masks, um, all masks from the district. That motion, uh, the administration has to interpret um, what happens in a meeting and, and uh, my understanding was, or I felt, that that motion or the context of that was with regard to mask wearing in our schools as opposed to, and, and we view this as a little bit separately, um, when it comes to students or faculty for that matter, staff, who um, have been, have tested positive um, and would be out for five days and have to wear a mask according to CDC guidelines 
wear a mask for five days uh, when they return back to work or school. So uh, that's what Mrs. Everly is talking about, the difference here. Um, and uh, again, the, the administration has simply been continued to follow the um, CDC guidelines on that topic. Um, but I just wanted to clarify or add a little bit more information. Thank you. Any other discussion regarding? What you just heard. <laughs> My assumption is, is that, um, you know, the motion passed um, and the administration made the interpretation and um, without a different motion then the, the current situation remains the same well I would just I want to make a motion to stick with the original motion to eliminate all masking requirements in the district all means all um, all right hold on here I think the, the better way to put this is probably masking requirements eliminate all masking requirements the in the health and, health and safety plan. Is that would that be accurate to capture everything and all? All masking requirements okay. currently listed on the health and safety plan. That motion is made by Mrs. Eberly. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Second by Mr. Kressler. Further discussion? So, Dr. Suffolk, can you? What what exactly is the the masking protocol for? You can just walk us through it one more time. Yeah, so um, currently, the CDC recommendation is if you test positive, um, you would, and when you return back to work or school, that you uh, the recommendation is for you to be masked for five days, and then if you were a um, if you were someone who was in quarantine or in close contact that you would wear a mask um, for five days as well. Um, so that, that's, that's really what it comes down to, is whether or not we want to eliminate that requirement um, at this point or, or just go with the, uh, I'm assuming go with, the, we would continue to do the um, isolation period that is recommended for someone who's tested positive for close contact. So you're saying that if we were to eliminate masking, then we would ask students to stay home during that five-day period? No, they're already home. They're, they're already home. Oh, so they're already home. It would be five, like a, so it would be five, so if, if right now, if you test positive for COVID-19, the recommendation is that you would be, you would be isolated for five days, and then the next five days, you can return back to school or work, but you, you should wear a mask. And so I think what Mrs. Eberly is stating is that that also would be removed from the district's um, health and safety plan. But there hasn't been any change in the CDC recommendations in regard to this. Not, not that I'm aware of. And again, I'll look over to Mrs. Martin. No change. Okay. I mean, to me, that sounds like a perfectly reasonable uh, ask of our students to protect the other students, teachers, staff, and community. Uh, it's not at all onerous, um, and again, I'll just state my position continually has been that we should follow CDC recommendations. Any other discussion on the Eberly Kressler motion? Yes, I'd like to make a couple of comments too. First, uh, Dr. Suppo, I'd like to, to understand what your recommendation would be in terms of this motion that's on the floor. Uh, again, the administration had to interpret what the um, motion was on the 14th of February. We did so using the um, CDC guidelines and what they're still recommending. And so this, uh, my recommendation would be that we continue to follow those with regard to students who are in quarantine or um, tested positive. Right. And ju just one more comment. It, it's my understanding that, that what the CDC did here is they... It, 
and, and uh, you or M Mrs. Martin can correct me, but they reduced the uh, quarantine requirements in an effort to get students back in the classroom, but, but, um, it, but added this masking piece to, to, um, to try to ensure uh, maximize safety as well as maxim maximizing the students in the classroom. Is, is that a fair assumption? Yeah, I, I believe it was done in a, in a way to reduce reduce the number of days of isolation and get people back to work and school. Yeah, then then I couldn't possibly support the uh, motion at this time. Any other comments? We are still one of the only districts that are still quarantining healthy students who have not tested positive and still expecting them to mask up and to miss five days. Why are students who are not even testing positive being asked to leave school when we know what we know about this variant? Like, this should not even be up for this. Uh, like, to me, it's very frustrating to see healthy kids being out of school for five days and then coming back and wearing a mask. And it literally identifies these students as possibly being sick. Um, you know, it literally labels them. If they know that it's a student who typically is mask optional and then you come back with a mask, you're also labeling these kids, um, you know, as being sick. And like, we don't wanna raise our children in fear, but there are still some people living in fear who, uh, you know, we, we teach our kids to be kind um, and it, it's literally labeling them when they're coming back to school. Um, All right, any, any other discussion? Yeah, I have a, I have a question. Uh, the, if a student, is has the virus is treated is different than the one that doesn't have a virus right but if he doesn't have a virus he got five days if he doesn't if he has a virus he's out for they're five days the same huh they're treated the same all right so if kid has five his virus he has to wear a mask when he come back a student has to wear a mask when he come back and so if one doesn't he still has to come back so, so my only my for me all of this i'm more concerned about the kids in special education and special and medical conditions that's my concern about being around people that, not, that have it and then come back and are not masked. So for me, that, that's my problem, that's my position. I think the, the exception, um, and forgive me because again, these rules change frequently, but I believe the exception to that, um, to answer your question, Mr. Scott, is there's a distinction between, uh, between those who um, have either had the virus in the last 90 days or those who had, had been vaccinated with regard to that period of time. But other than that, it's, it's the same. Is that accurate, Mrs. Martin? And I do also believe that the CDC also says that they accept antibody tests, which I don't believe our district is currently um, accepting that as, you know, like if you provide a um, an immunization, that is good enough, but it's, we are not currently accepting antibody tests, which the CDC says is acceptable. I, I will again refer to Mrs. Martin. Has anyone presented an antibody test here in the district? No, I've had discussions with one of the local physicians, and in that discussion, um, they had informed me that there's two types of antibody tests. There's one that Any other discussion on the, I, I think we're still on the Everly Chrysler motion. Roll call. Mr. Fred Scott. No. Mr. Jim Bard. No. Mr. Dwayne Burt. No. Mr. Levi Chrysler. Yes. Mrs. Stephanie Everly. Yes. Dr. Nathan Goats. No. Mr. Don Hilbinger. No. Mr. Charlie Suters. Yes. Mr. Mark Butterball. Yes. Four yes, five no. Motion failed. Any other discussion on the health and safety plan? All right, I gotta figure out where we're at. 
Um, well, that's it. We'll move on to citizen comments. Um, citizen comments are, uh, this is for any non-agenda items. We have six. Darren, we have five. Amanda McNair. Thank you, Amanda. Becky Wolfinger. Uh, Becky Wolfinger, Southampton Township. Um, it's nice to see all of you guys smiling tonight. Um, isn't choice an amazing thing? Yes, yes it is. Um, so yes, the mandate is gone, but if your beliefs, as many of you have been steadfast with, um, that masks work, then why are you not continuing to wear them tonight is my question, but we force our children to continue to wear them. I, I think that's I think that's out of order, Mr. President. I, I don't know I don't know why I should be questioned for why I'm not wearing a mask. Mr. Bird, I did respectfully I did not single you out in any way. Everybody here, none of you are wearing a mask. Well, uh, are you not aware of the the, the change in the, the, the CDC guidance uh, from Friday? I just think it's inappropriate. That, 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 that one person would question another person or one person would be allowed to question a group about why, they're, why they are or not wearing a mask. Isn't that, isn't that the individual right of the person? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, allow, I'm gonna allow the public comment. Um, it wasn't directed towards any one board member, it was Thank directed you. at the board. Um, for two years I have fought on behalf of my kids and others for choice. Um, tonight I'm asking for our district to choose living life over fear. Um, my husband and I do not believe in living a life of what if. Um, my child is far more likely to be injured or killed in a traffic accident on the way to school than from COVID, but he gets on the bus every single day. But wait, that isn't the reason that the band trip was canceled. I mean no disrespect to Mr. Mag, to you know our two band reps, to Miss Luffy or to Miss Martin, but you do not get to teach my child to live in fear. Why were the you know countless, I mean, we have 100 band students, countless parents not involved in being a part of this decision. Why were five people allowed to make this decision for my student? Five. Why is that? Tuesday night, when I had to tell my son, you did not have to wipe his tears away. None of you did. I did. My husband did. Did you know that my son is in the ninth grade? He's not had a normal experience yet with being in band. His seventh grade trip was canceled, his eighth grade trip was canceled, and now his ninth grade trip was canceled. COVID has taken away every bit of normal from my son's experience in education. 
He has worked so hard to excel in everything that he does so that he has a bright future. And band is one of the bright spots every day for him when he walks into Mr. Mag's class that he enjoys. When you ask him who his favorite teacher is, it's Mr. Mag. Who is the teacher that I respect the most? It's Mr. Mag because of the relationship that he has with those children, the encouragement that he gives those children, and the voice that he gives every one of those children through music. Not even me as a parent can do that, but our educator does that. And five people got to decide to take this away from my son. How do I explain to my son that he can't travel, but yet the sports teams can travel over PA, and two language clubs this, this summer can travel? but my kid can't. How do I explain that to him? These clubs pulled the parents together and involved them in the decision-making process. But me as a stakeholder, I had no feedback at all in the process. We continue to take every bit of a normal school experience away from some of the most vulnerable in our community. These kids are suffering in silence on many occasions. Becky, your three yeah. minutes are up. Okay. Thank Stop you making them comments. suffer. Sonia Payne? Sonia Payne? Oh, she's from SCRC. Oh. Oh, she clicked over there. Um, Chris Jackson? Thank you. First, I want to echo Mrs. Wolfinger's comments. There were a lot of tears on a lot of kids over the band trip. Not even just that it was canceled. Not even that just two days after the Chambersburg band, much bigger, planned things out better, had their contingency plans in place, and I would assume included their school board in the communication and the decision making, which none of that happened here again. Mr. Mag's amazing. Mrs. Luffy's, Luffy's awesome. Big fan of both of theirs. But this was not handled well or correctly. And yet again, our failings as a district hurt our kids the most. And I believe they're the ones we're here for, supposedly. How about our actions, our votes, our motions, and our seconds actually start to reflect that fact? You failed us tonight. Healthy children and students in this district are continuing to be discriminated against, and we are failing them yet again. You are failing them yet again. You missed your moment. You missed the opportunity to repeal and replace the health and safety plan that continues to put an unnecessary burden on our kids. You failed tonight to show courage and common sense. And I know that's rare. I know that's hard. But that's why you were elected. You are not up to the moment tonight, nor the calling at hand. That's sad for our kids, our kids. And it'll have significant repercussions on our kids and on our district and maybe for years to come. Our kids deserve better. Thank you for failing them and failing all of us tonight. Barbara? Barbara? Correct. Go ahead, Barbara. I'm Barbara Dickey. I live in the district in A. My heart is heavy and it hurts. As I said, I'm older than all of you. And I've been a part of all kinds of universities, all kinds of education, but never before have I seen what's happening in this school district. We're dealing with a virus that's .000, 47 hundredth of a, hundred thousandths of a micro. No mask, no face covering, nothing is gonna keep it from going through. It's too, too small. I would think with the intellect that I see sitting here, that we could get that, that we could get that. And it's time to drop this health and safety plan. 
It's time to move on. And here's what I noticed as, as a person who does dialectic behavioral therapy. I study people. I study their language. I study it all. When you have these groups that you invited in here, your, your, temp, your temper changed, your whole attitude changed, you did dialogue with them. I saw human beings. I encourage you to open up that when someone speaks to an agenda piece, that you allow some dialogue. Give us some dialogue about this band trip. What are people thinking? Five people made a decision for 100 band members. What are we thinking? Are you telling me that you don't care about these kids and this is just a job? I'm appalled. I'm appalled. I moved into Shippensburg May 25th. I'm a Katrina transplant. I did 16 days in West Jeff Hospital serving a broken city. And I look at the school district dragging its feet while all the rest of them are stepping up to the plate. And I will tell you, I've had my Facebook page stalked. I've had some of my uh, staff who is, is uh, friends with uh, some uh, relatives of this board. I've had all kinds of things said. I've had Facebook comments done. I'm sorry, but if we are a mature group of adults, then we've got to start acting like that. I hope you can sleep tonight because I've got children that have got ticks so bad that they can't function. I've got one little boy I'm dealing with that's been bullied so badly that he can't function. I've got another little girl who has rashes. I've got people who their speech is delayed. What are you thinking? I have five, three grown children and five grandchildren. And they are in different parts of the state, in different parts of, of the United States, and they're not having to experience what this school district is doing. Think. Think. If you do not care about our kids, then resign and allow those that do to care about our kids, because my heart is hurting. My heart is hurting. I have not worn a mask since the whole mess started. When I worked as, at the distribution center at Walmart in uh, Bethesda, or in, uh, um, over by the, uh, the spa, and when I saw our stores, our grocery stores empty, but that uh, warehouse was full, I knew we had games here. How long are you intellectual people going to buy into these games? This is a scandemic. This is not a pandemic. Now, I realize that the uh, virus is real. And if you get it, but it's because your immune system is not making enough glutathione. You're not healthy enough. I hug everybody. And I have not been sick once. I don't care if you've got COVID or not. If you're a child of God, I'm going to hug you because my immune system is solid. I am 74. I operate like a 20-year-old. So when are we going to get a life and realize these students need us to make a different decision. We need it tonight to have dropped this whole health and safety plan. We need it to have removed masks everywhere. And we need it to step up to the plate and rescind this vote about the band trip and somehow fix that so that these students have somewhere to go. And answer my question about Chambersburg. Why was Chambersburg not called? Because they figured out how to go to Orlando. Why were they not called? And if you can't answer all of my questions, then you're not doing your job. You're not doing your job. Think about it. I've asked several good questions, and I've said if you can't answer them, then resign. Resign. Think about it. Think about it. I have 11 seconds, and I'm going to use them. Think about it. I love you all, and God loves you. And we have a group of us that are praying for you night and day. We care about you. Now show that you care about us. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. All right, we'll move to information date savers, March 7th. Oh, yeah. Let me do this. Go ahead. March 7th is the Budget and Finance Committee meeting. March 10th is the outrage, outrageous right here at the Senior High School. March 10th to 12th is the High School Musical, My Fair Lady. March 14th, board meeting. March 16th is the active meeting, two hour early dismissal. March 18th, no school for students and teachers. March 24th starts the fourth marking period already. March 24th is also the evening of jazz uh, here in the auditorium. March 28th is a school board meeting. We'll do April later. <laughs> um, Dr. Seppo. 
I, I, I'm sorry, I, I do need to take a moment to correct something that was said a couple of times here um, that, is, that is inaccurate. Um, Mr. Mag sent out a memo to all of the families indicating that he had made the decision to cancel the trip. He, in that letter, also indicated that there were a number of people who participated in the committee as, in an ongoing discussion about the trip. So I've heard it twice tonight that this group of five made that decision. That is not accurate. Mr. Mag, the band director, ultimately made that decision. I will tell you, though, as a team who supports each other, we support and understand his decision. But that decision was not made by those five individuals. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to board comments. Mr. Scott? Nothing. <laughs> Mrs. Everly? Um, I had a question. Um, I don't know if it, it's already scheduled, but um, as far as the kindergarten registration dates for the 22-23 school year, um, they're scheduled virtually for March 29th, 30th, and the 30, 31st. Um, with the easing of COVID mitigations, it appears um, that uh, the registration can be moved face to face. Um, is that something that we can look into or who needs to look at that to determine um, a face to face registration? Um, I'll, I'll check with Mrs. Woodall because she helps coordinate that. I will say um, while the registration piece itself was virtually, there still would be, uh, families was, would still be invited to go back to the school or attend the school, not, excuse me, not attend the school, visit the school during the summer months. So um, even though that portion, that initial registration portion was virtually, there still was the intent to have the families and the students back in um, prior to the start of the school year. Um, and I just want to thank, uh, it was nice to see uh, our FFA students here and Mrs. Akers. Um, and I do just want to say, um, you know, it's been said that, you know, us sitting up here, we don't care about the students. Um, a lot of us board members, we all have different um, ideologies, different personalities, different beliefs. But at the end of the day, we all care about our students. Um, I don't know one person sitting up here that doesn't have the best interest of our students at heart. Um, it might look differently. And I think when we talk about um, the wisdom that we have sitting up here. That's the one thing I do love about this board is that we all have different attributes um, that make us unique and that we can work well together and, um, you know, complement each other. Um, but I, it, please don't like believe or think that, you know, we don't care about the students because we don't, um, you know, do or say, you know, what you, you think that we should say but we're all here ultimately for the students. I don't know any other reason why we would be sitting up here if it weren't for them. <laughs> Mr. Burt? No comment. Mr. Hilbinger? I did bring a mask with me tonight, and I had in the back of my mind a set of circumstances that in which if they came to be, I would wear it. Those circumstances did not happen to show themselves, but I still think that you have to consider the masking in context with what some other people may want, et cetera. And um, like I said, I, I did bring it with me tonight, didn't wear it because the set of circumstances that I had in the back of my mind for making me to decide whether or not I would wear one uh, did not develop tonight. Thank you. Mr. Kressler? Well, Ms. Mrs. Everly stole my comment about the FFA, but I, I want to reiterate that. I thought it was great seeing students here because I think at the end of the day, that's why everybody's here, and she again stole that comment from me as well. Um, but I enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to see, I don't know if this is something, uh, Mrs. Luffy sitting out here, if we can find a way to organize other clubs, groups, teams, and things like that for recognition. Um, it doesn't have to just be the high school. She's the only one I see sitting here, but I, I think that's awesome. Um, and it, it, it uh, gives students the opportunity to participate in something that is not easy for them. As they stood up here, you saw some of them kind of stumble across words, and that's probably the first time they've spoken with a spotlight like that on them. So I, I think that's a cool thing. Um, so if we could try to incorporate those kind of things in the future, that'd be great. Thanks. Clark? No, no, no. Dr. Good? Yeah, thank you. Just a couple comments. So we talked about facilities. We talked about the stadium before, but I wanted to add one thought. I, I didn't want to say it in that context because 
this is more of a sort of opinion than, than um, I thought that discussion warranted. But, you know, it, it's clear that the, uh, that, the, that the board wants, um, uh, you know, that the will of the board is that we have a, a, a you know, a, a kind of, let's call it a flagship stadium uh, at, uh, on the high school campus. Um, and, uh, and it seems that, I mean, there was some possibility that there might be like a community backlash against that and we might hear from voices of folks saying that they, they don't want that. That hasn't happened, so I, I, mostly what I'm hearing is a sort of collective shrug um, from the community in regards um, to the location of the stadium. So I just want to say, like, I, I'm, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I'm moving full speed ahead with, you know, a high school stadium plan. Like, we've got we to find a way to make that work, uh, in, you know, to meet our needs and, and sort of fiscal responsibility. On the other hand, <coughs> Our, our resources are limited in regards to like playing fields and whatever. And it would be absolutely foolish for us to in any way kind of divorce ourselves from Memorial Park. I think we need those playing fields to limit our resources, whether they be practice fields or whether they be retooled to be competition fields for soccer or field hockey or whatever else we use fields for. So I want to ask the, all of the board to consider that, to keep in the back of their mind, like how we can best continue the relationship with the park, perhaps investing some resources in it so that, so that those resources are still available for our athletic needs, for the district's athletic needs, but also uh, for the broader needs of the community. Um, I think, uh, you know, and I was happy to have uh, Bruce Hockersmith here, and, and, and I, you know, take him at his word that, uh, the borough is absolutely willing to work with us. I'm sure that the um, uh, the Parks Authority is as well, uh, and we need to we need to find a way um, that works for everybody to to continue to take advantage of those resources, even if it isn't for uh, a sort of large occupancy occupancy stadium. Uh, second thing I want to say, I, you know, I, I I think along with all of you, I rejoiced in the new recommendations from uh, the CDC. I was happy to see that our surrounding counties were in the medium category and that Adams County is even in the low, category, low risk category, so um, perhaps that gives, gives us some hope that we'll be there too. Um, I, I'm excited about that, um, but uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know, I, I'm sure I'm not the only person that um, appreciates that over the past couple of years, like, you know, I've, I've been masking, the people around me have been masking, and I haven't gotten sick. I haven't got the cold, I haven't got the flu, our doctor's offices are <laughs> sort of absent. I mean, the, you know, the sort of regular cold flu stuff, especially last winter, was just absent. People, it wasn't happening. Um, and it speaks to the value in, of, of, of the courtesy of, uh, of thinking of others when we are not feeling well. And so I hope that as a community, I mean, you know, we can do what we can with, with our students and in our district to, to normalize the, the, the sort of act of, of of, um, of, of empathy and kindness, uh, that when we are not feeling well, that we stay home, that we don't go out into crowds, or if we have to go out into public, that we mask up. Uh, it absolutely uh, makes uh, a huge difference, uh, but it's up to us. It's up to us to decide that, and it's up to us to destigmatize it. Unfortunately, there are so many, I mean, we've heard comments here tonight that help to stigmatize the wearing of masks. Uh, and that's all very unfortunate because here we got this very simple, easy, low cost act of kindness to our neighbors that we can engage in uh, and, uh, uh, and, and we should all, you know, sort of rejoice in that, in that opportunity um, to help our community. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Mr. Seeger? All right, um, just real quick, we did have, uh, I forgot to mention that the board did have an executive session before this meeting to discuss personnel matters and a student relations matter. Um, thank you to the FFA. It was a great presentation. Um, please be sure to, uh, Deb, to relay that as the board's gratitude. It was, it was wonderful hearing from the students. Um, uh, thanks again to Dr. Patterson for your presence here tonight and for your hospitality, I appreciate that. Um, and I echo Steph's comments that um, I don't, I know I'm not sitting here just because 
I don't like kids. Um, I get ashamed of some of the comments that are made. Uh, it's just a continual breakdown in public discourse in, in this community, and, and it's sad. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. I think the community is used to it now. So it is what it is. I take a motion to adjourn. Fred Scott, make a motion Second. to adjourn. Second.